Sick was it today? It should be a fun discussion we've lost. And the Ilya? Where did the Ilya go? Okay, we'll start, we'll start now and hopefully he joins us. Um, what I was going to do is I was going to ask you guys the most burning question I had for each of you um, based on the presentation. And there are a few more general things that I'd love to talk about. Ilya, come back. <laughs> um, uh, so, Jeff, why don't we start with you? So, you had an interesting phrase up there, which was Godless Intelligent Design. So, we, we talked a little bit about biological switch and then obviously the computational approach. We are a wetware, this is silicon, right? And so, should we be kind of taking inspiration from biology wholesale or are there areas where, because this is a silicon substrate, we really need to divorce ourselves from biological methods? How do you think about that? Okay, so I think we can get a lot from looking at how biology is used. It's the only example of general purpose intelligence. And until recently, it was the only example of just object recognition or speech recognition. And in fact, those of us who spent the 80s and 90s and zeros um, working on neural nets, we wouldn't have done it if it hadn't been for biology. Nobody in their right mind would have said, well, maybe if I make a great big network, a very simple pressing elements with random weights, and I just hope that there's some magic learning algorithm that will make it all work just by exposing it to data. Um, the reason for believing that was a very simplified notion of how biology is working. Um, but that was the inspiration. But I think there are places where the inspiration is incorrect. And we'll talk about one of them in a couple of days. I could go on for a long time, so you'll have to stop me. <laughs> so I'll give, you, I'll give you one example where I think I was seriously misled by that. So, I've been trying to make systems where you have lots of learning organisms, and they exchange information by, they make predictions, and you look at the predictions the other ones make. So, these learning organisms, they kind of publish their predictions. Each learning organism looks at data and tries to develop a model based on the data you can actually see. But it also tries to fit in with the published predictions of other organisms, which are maybe slightly out of date. And that's a very simple model of science. Um, and it explains how a bunch of scientists can be smarter than one scientist. They can get through a lot more data. And so this is a very interesting form of parallelism. Um, and I've been trying to get it to work for a long time without much success. But I've come to the conclusion recently that there's a huge difference between artificial neural networks and biological neural networks. And the huge difference is that artificial neural networks can exchange parameters. And so they don't have to have this publish results and read other people's results, but never look inside their heads. We can't exchange parameters because all our brains are different. And we lose a lot. So I think actually not being able to exchange internal parameters because we have different brains is the Achilles heel of real neural networks. It's what makes us more. If, if, if not for that, we could just run on somebody else's hardware and we could be in that was the only question that I did not ask during the uh, lightning round was what comes first, whole brain emulation or digital superintelligence? So I think that's responsible. But <laughs> um, the only other clarifying kind of question I had for you on that is you talk a little bit about DNA. You talk about sort of things that are important in other ways like reptilian brains and cortex. Do you have analogs and models that you build that you can use with the rest of us? Or is that, is that kind of what you So the idea about adaptation of multiple time scales somebody has that look. So, Russ talked about neural nets with external memory. Um, and then for doing things that you would do inside your head, but the external memory is somehow inside your head. And if you ask, how can I get an external memory inside your head? Well, the way to do it is to have um, synapses that adapt rapidly and decay rapidly, which are the fast ways. There's lots of evidence for those in biology. And they give you temporary storage. And that's something our current neural nets don't have, except for a few. Um, Russ, I've got a question for you, which is, you, you mentioned smiling up without reason is the basis of being an idiot. We know that you are the opposite of an idiot, so you do not smile facelessly. What makes you smile these days? I see, I see, yeah, so it's actually, <coughs> um, it's, 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 it's a truth saying that I didn't lie about it in, 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 in Russia, and it's, um, you know, you're not supposed to go on the street and smile because people will basically either think that you are basically uh, something is wrong with you or you try to attack someone. It's actually took me a while once I moved to the States, it was doing my undergrad, it took me a while to adapt 
big notion that people can just smile and get out of the music. But uh, what makes you smile these days? I think that, I mean, all the products that we're seeing, obviously, and I think one, one thing that actually sucks me a lot using this is, is being able to work with students, with students that see you, and uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's remarkable to see how. Um, I feel like machine learning right now. We, when I was like, I was like when I was a uh, uh, PhD student, you know, machine learning wasn't really popular field. Uh, like back in like 2004, 2004, it was you know one of those fields that uh, obscurity to rock star, right? Yeah, if you look at the faculty positions, you basically have maybe like a couple of folks in these, uh, and you know, very smart folks graduating, could find jobs, and, and then by 2000. 12, 2013, you start seeing, you can actually see these students. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable. You know, there was a story where at Toronto, uh, Jeff, myself, and a couple of other faculty, I think at some point Google said, you know, we're looking for people in internships. And we'll pay 40000 for a PhD student to go to an internship for three or four months or, or for, for a specific project. And I remember we had a group at the University of Toronto, a bunch of students saying, you know, Google has this uh, proposal, who, who would want to do that? And by 2000, I think it was 2014, you could see a lot of students just sitting there thinking, and then uh, one student, uh, Charlie, basically said, well, how about that? <laughs> so by that time, you, know, you knew that, you know, something was going on. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's exactly and in the field of machine learning, I feel like I'm seeing you at Toronto as well. We being treated like you know, like no no other department in, in the school just because so many applicants and there's so much demand in teaching and so that's that's really exciting. I mean, today I don't know when it's gonna last a lot, uh, but today it's, it's, it's truly exciting to be in a machine or to be in AI field. That's awesome. And I would guess that way. Um, Marzia, let's talk about the machine learning. Um, one of the things that kind of blew me away when you, by the way, I think you're doing incredibly inspiring work, it's very important, so thank you for doing that. Um, you talked a bit about bias, and I know that's important to you, and, and the thing I think I didn't internalize was there's a bias that we know about, which we can intuitively feel, but then you talk about a lot of cases of bias that we just don't have good intuitions around. How do we make sure we reduce that, both types of bias over time? Um, so, thank you for the compliment. The, the story that I, that I told my students, which is, which is true, is when I started at MIT, my PhD advisor told me, MIT is a praise-free zone, so don't expect any compliments. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very strange to, to get like lots of compliments. Canadians are very nice. <laughs> um, I think that there are a lot of biases that we know about, and maybe we know about them in the epi, the, the epidemiological sense of, you know, that societal biases against people for age, gender, ethnicity, weight, whatever, it doesn't matter. Those will be reflected in their interactions with other humans. So doctors are human, so probably it'll be reflected in their care. And this has been established pretty significantly in a really, really um, uh, weighty literature um, where people have said that certain individuals get less access to health care, even when they can access health care, the treatments are not as good. So if this is true, um, we can do something about it. But then there was really good work by, uh, by a few NLP people that said, uh, so, you know, right now what we do if we want to use a large corpus of text is we say, ah, it's, it's too much. What do we do? We need to pre-process it. How do I pre-process it? I want to use text to de decide who gets a job. So I need to read millions of resumes, millions of job applications. I can't do that by hand. I'll just write a quick algorithm. How do I pre-process the text? I can look at the most cited papers, these word embedding things, download that code, run it on the stuff, bam, right? I have word vectors and I can build a classifier. And then you have, and so this is true, people really use these word embeddings, right? Like they're, they're very widely used, like students will do their projects with them. Um, and then there was a great paper two years ago, I think, that showed how biased these are, right? So, you know, these word embeddings are really good. So they get the SAT question of man is to woman as king is to queen. 
They also get man as to woman as computer scientist is to homemaker. And so they're, they're being learned on real data. And so they're going to learn things that we won't know to check for because maybe we have our own biases. And so I think those unseen biases, when we discover them, can be really toxic. But it's, it's already off and running. We all use these embeddings, right? And it's our default today, so we can only improve from that, right? Exactly. And yeah, I've seen various versions of that, that compute chart, and it just blows me away every time. So my question for you is simple. If we look to the future, does she or he who has the most compute win? Well, I, so, <laughs> I think that you need to have enough compute. You can't. Basically, it increases your odds. If you have really good ideas that no one else has, you could go further with less compute. That's generally a for any resource. But yeah, more compute is better. And right now, we reach the point where, but you know, if you step back in history, then at first, you know, it had the GPU, and the GPU was great. You could try neural nets really fast. Then we learned how to put HPUs in a box and use parallelism there. So you got HPUs running together. And now thousands, tens of thousands of GPUs, no problem. So I would expect in two years people to routinely run experiments with 100,000 GPUs, provided they have a, you know, a large enough cluster. 100,000 GPUs is not cheap. But I think that's where the most extreme advances will come from. So I think that, yeah, you feel like it really helps a lot. And you can compensate for it, but not too much. And so, all of you on this panel work on more powerful, more generalizable uh, versions of, of silicon-based intelligence. When we look to the future, say, 10 or 15 years out, does our notion of intelligence get simpler or more complex? Like, is this going to be an amalgamation of a whole bunch of different methods, or is there going to be some very simple principle that governs the way this intelligence evolves? And certain any way you see that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go. I, I have strong feelings about the matter, which are based on a part of fact. <laughs> and it seems to me like the reason I find deep learning so emotionally exciting to me is that it doesn't care which problem to solve already. We, what we've seen is a simplification of the concepts that go into building machine learning. It is completely mind blowing to me. That the same, almost the same piece of code, essentially the same ideas that they use to solve vision, also solve speech recognition, and machine translation. You sprinkle it all with reinforcement learning, and now you can learn to play Go, you can learn to play Dota, and you can get problems to robots to manipulate blocks. And the ideas now that it's all the same. You've seen some initially, you know, initial and exciting progress in unsupervised learning, and the ideas there are also simple. And what I predict is going to happen is that we actually get to the end. We're going to say, God, this is so simple. Why did those not very smart researchers have any trouble with it at that point in time? Who's up next? Thank you for that, Elia. I think I have a speculation of what may happen is in order to get a hundred trillion synapses left, so we can compete with the amount of knowledge in a human game um, and low power. We may end up using nanotechnology to actually grow things like brains. So it may get much less silicon chip now. And it may actually go so, if you combine the learning with the growing, which might make a lot of sense, you may get back to the Achilles heel. You may get back to systems where you can't just make a copy of the system and run to another hardware. It only runs on that hardware. And that hardware is grown as it learned. And so, you're back to where you are with both. We might as well say that dichotomy at the beginning of Silicon versus what we're going to use the We may not have So the thing I want to end with here, and, and you mentioned Ilya the Black Hole in Silicon Valley, but um, I'm sure you hear it just as much as I do people talking about. And I, I kind of operate as a self Canadian sometimes. You sometimes do that, so you sometimes don't. And so people just mention that AI in Toronto is really a thing, and it's, it's very, very common. So I just wanted, and you were, Jeff, you were our cheerleader. Um, for Canada in general, the lightning round. So just 
Last year, my favorite article that came out of this conference was why artificial intelligence should be more Canadian. And so I just wanted you guys to talk about AI here versus AI elsewhere and what pops up here. Well, you could be so you could look at it like an economist and you could ask, how much is Canada investing in AI and how much is China investing in AI? And that would be very depressing. <laughs> Um, it's an awful lot of very smart Chinese graduate students, and they're going to invest a lot of money in it, and they've got a lot of access to data, some untrammeled access to data. So I think that aspect of it is worse. So one thing that I would like to say, slightly, slightly more positive, I, I, is this is one of the few places where you can do machine learning for health and believe your results because you have a single single payer healthcare system. So fee for service is it's still there, right? But you don't have quite the same incentives to treat for money. If you have healthcare data in the US, it's 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 touched by that. There's no way of getting around it. You also have incredible diversity. Right? We have all of this data on a huge number of people in Ontario, and we have information about how they were treated, how they lived their lives, you know, what happened to them afterwards, and we have real diversity. We have capital D diversity, income diversity, genetic diversity. Um, there are people from everywhere here, and they're all participating in these systems. And so I think one way that artificial intelligence could really benefit by being more Canadian is by having access to data that is generated in this way, because if we learn generalized healthcare models from healthcare data from China, it's going to look really different than a majority of the world. Same thing for Sweden, or even a lot of the hospitals in the United States. That's fantastic. And so, Marzia, I hope so. Just one point I also can make is, you know, in Toronto and in CNU, I think one thing that um, good improvement in Canada in particular is the universities. And universities, in a sense, are being a little bit more, so we're looking for flexible, a little bit more adaptive. Uh, just looking at the difference between the schools like Amos Control, which is a great school, and its space of adapting and adopting AI versus what I've seen in places like CU and MIT, where they're moving at a much faster scale, at least the way that's, that's, you know, I feel that way. So we need just faster adaptation, right? Yes, exactly. So, so, so we definitely need that. You know, same year, for example, they're they, you know, they offering bachelors of science and artificial intelligence. So they're moving much quicker, at least that's what I'm seeing in the state, in the education system. And maybe just a difference between private schools and public schools, but I think that, um, to Jeff's uh, leadership, I think that, you know, uh, if, if Canada could be a little bit more active and, and, and move a little bit faster, particularly when it comes down to the education system. The vector has to be. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's a really good thing. So the federal government, so like the industry, are all very fast. It's the hypocrisy of the university. Yeah, I, I, I want to add into that as well, very briefly. I think that, I think that on, on, in, in terms of, like, giant, Companies, I think that we take some time for Canada to catch up. But I think one place in Canada has been, and it will likely continue to punch about its face, is it research. And I think one factor it is because of uh, because research at the core it, it is for the talent game, and Canada has some really outstanding talent because of immigration. And so I expect this to continue to be a very uh, strong factor that will help continue Canada's succeed. Fantastic. Well, I hope you guys will join me in thanking our four panelists in there. Right <laughs>